Welcome to the Archaeology Studio. Today's episode concerns the concepts of antiquity and cultural change in archaeology. By the end of this episode, you will be able to describe the intellectual roots of these concepts and discuss how they have been applied in establishing the time periods, the contexts, and the definitions of ancient cultures. Today, Everyone can appreciate that excavations beneath the ground will uncover older materials with each deeper layer. Nonetheless, we may question the specific ages of each layer, and we may follow different ways of documenting and interpreting the artifacts and other materials within each layer. This presentation will review how archaeologists have come to recognize the age range of humanity and the implications for studying cultural change through time. You will learn about how archaeologists make sense of the apparent cultural chronologies reflected in the archaeological record, and you will learn about some of the scientific principles guiding this scope of work. While much of this information has influenced scientific thought in general, I will concentrate on the relevance in archaeology. Regarding the age of the Earth, some European scholars had advanced a notion that everything was created a few thousand years ago. This view was based on literal reading of certain Christian texts with implications that the Earth's geology, biological organisms, and humanity all had been created within a few days and then have not changed significantly since that time. The classic example of this view was published by James Usher in the year 1654. Usher had calculated a precise date of the creation of the Earth in the year 4004 BC. Eventually, his proposed date would be proven incorrect and far too shallow. But similar ideas had prevailed at least into the 1800s and were difficult to contradict in European scholarship. Even at that time, however, most European scholars were aware that the Roman Empire could be traced back to the first few centuries BC, and that the empire's predecessors could be traced back at least to 1000 BC. During the 1800s, Jacques Boucher de Perc was curious about stone tools that he observed in gravel pits and other exposures of ancient geological layers. He identified specific attributes of chipping that he concluded must have been handmade by ancient people. These apparently ancient stone tools were completely different from anything mentioned in the chronicles of ancient Greece and Rome or within the experience of European scholars at that time they suggested a radically older time period and different context. Boucher de Perth concluded that he had found evidence of the people who had lived prior to the legendary flood mentioned in Judeo-Christian traditions. Today, some of the stone tools are recognized as flint hand axes of the Achillean tradition, dated perhaps 300,000 years old. In 1863, a major advancement was made in the scientific knowledge of the Earth's geological formation and its long-term change. Charles Lyell published Geological Evidences of the Antiquity of Man. Based on his documentation of sequences of geological layers, Lyell found evidence of an ancient ice age followed by the Earth's present-day conditions but with several internal components or layers that spanned over apparently long periods of time. Charles Lyell's other work had established the basic principles of geological stratigraphy and the chronological ordering of layers. His 1863 work, however, clarified that human beings had been living and contributing material evidence into the geological record at least as early as the last major ice age. At the time of Lyell's work in the 1800s, radiocarbon and other chronometric dating did not yet exist, but clearly the last ice age by far predated anything known in European histories. Today, we can point to the end of the last ice age, or the Pleistocene, around 10,000 years ago, and we can refer to many different geological periods extending back to the formation of the Earth about 4.6 billion years ago. 
Knowing that people lived through the transition from the last Ice Age or Pleistocene into our current conditions of the Holocene, we can begin to consider the degree of change in human societies over time. The environmental conditions surely were quite different, and the stone tools were remarkably unlike anything known in later periods. What else could we learn about cultural change through the apparently long geological time of human existence? How could we explain this evidence? Clues about explaining long-term chronological change in the world in fact were developing in the field of biology at the same time when Charles Lyell was publishing his work in geology. One of the most influential contributions came from Charles Darwin's famous On the Origin of Species, published in 1859. Although technically published a few years later, Alfred Russell Wallace had been working with much of the same concepts of how biological species have evolved through inheritance, adaptation, and natural selection. Darwin and Wallace both found that biological species could adapt or evolve from one generation to the next, over time selecting for the traits that were most advantageous in their given environments. Of course, the principles and mechanics of biological evolution cannot be applied wholesale in human cultures. But importantly, the notion of long-term change had been gaining acceptance by the late 1800s. Already in the 1800s, antiquarians had proposed the classic three-age system of stone, bronze, and iron ages in Europe. The three-age system first had been proposed by Thompson in 1836, and then it was more fully developed by Vorsay in 1843, and especially in 1847 with the publication of his stratigraphic excavations. The overall sequence of stratigraphic layers of stone, bronze, and iron ages already had been demonstrated by the time when Charles Lyell, Charles Darwin, and Alfred Russell Wallace were publishing their major works in the 1850s and 1860s. All of this knowledge together, though, suggested that human beings have underwent significant change or adaptation through long periods of time. In an effort to explain long-term cultural change, John Lubbock published two major works in 1865 and 1870. Lubbock applied a Darwinian evolutionary model to the evidence that he saw in the archaeological record. Lubbock distinguished between an Old Stone Age or Paleolithic period and a New Stone Age or Neolithic period. We still use these terms today, although the definitions could be variable. In Lubbock's original formulation, the Paleolithic period referred to a time of ancient hunter-gatherers, and then the Neolithic period referred to the emergence of farming societies. This transition into the Neolithic period was associated with geological context that post-dated the last major ice age or the Pleistocene, and instead they were associated with the modern conditions of the Holocene. Lubbock's schematic of cultural chronology encouraged new descriptions of material assemblages of artifacts as reflections of larger cultural groups, such as seen in the Paleolithic versus Neolithic cultures. Meanwhile, antiquarian scholars were becoming more aware of how to correlate sets of artifacts with their original geological contexts as a way to trace chronological change. By the late 1800s, antiquarians had demonstrated convincingly about the Paleolithic, Neolithic, Bronze, and Iron Ages in many different places in the world in similar but not identical sequences. Scholars then began to develop ways of explaining the overall trends while also explaining the variability. By the 1920s, archaeology was growing as its own discipline aiming to learn about the ancient societies who had been responsible for creating the different assemblages of artifacts that we could discuss in terms of Paleolithic, Neolithic, or other categories. Central to this research was the notion that groups of artifacts could reflect the material remnants of larger societies that once existed. 
Regarding this notion of how to study an archaeological culture, V. Gordon Child usually is credited with the first formalized writing in 1929. His formulation involved two parts. First, Child observed that sets or assemblages of artifacts could be defined with their measurable geographic areas and time periods. Second, Child suggested that each defined artifact assemblage belongs to its own social or cultural context of a different group of people. Archaeologists have defined numerous assemblages worldwide and through varied time periods, similar to the many anthropological or ethnographic descriptions of the world's diverse societies. In both archaeology and ethnography, questions always need to be asked about how to differentiate between one group and another. Additional questions need to be addressed about how accurately a material archaeological assemblage can represent a full culture or society that once lived. You can imagine that originally a cultural group incorporated a spectrum of cultural traits in language, kinship, technological repertoire, economic practice, and more. Only partial samples of the group's original diverse cultural traits actually survive in the material archaeological record. Archaeologists have developed different approaches for assessing how the material samples relate with a larger social group. The concept of an archaeological culture depends on whatever any particular artifact assemblage actually represents. Some archaeologists prefer to focus on the most securely known aspects of technology and perhaps economy that are close with the material record. Others have proposed frameworks for interpreting social organization or political structure or other aspects of culture. Still other archaeologists prefer to avoid interpreting anything. Regardless of the differing opinions about archaeological cultures, we can see similar chronological sequences throughout the world. The details, of course, vary from one place to another, sometimes quite considerably, but archaeologists use some standard terminology to refer to these material assemblages. Archaeologists typically differentiate between Paleolithic and Neolithic groups, possibly with subdivisions in those categories, or with a potential intermediary Mesolithic category. Other distinctions can be made between hunter-gatherers and farmers, between pottery-bearing and non-pottery-bearing deposits, and so on. These terms offer general guidelines about the technology, subsistence economy, and perhaps a few other aspects of ancient cultural groups. Importantly, the details are different in each place of the world, and no single chronological sequence can be applied worldwide. In concluding this episode, now you can discuss the concepts of antiquity and cultural change in archaeology, specifically in terms of how they have influenced the studies of the ages, the contexts, and the definitions of ancient cultures. I hope that you enjoyed this episode and that you will explore more with the Archaeology Studio.